Okay, I've been done the noise video. Hello? How's it going? You managed to get here despite the, uh, the auto strike. Yeah. There's a tuk-tuk strike on me. Yeah, did anybody see a tuk-tuk on the way here? No. <laughs> okay, cool. So, um, yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about organising the celebrity. So this is a this is sort of a lot of new material. So I'm hoping that I'll be able to talk to you afterwards and tell me which bits you think are interesting and which bits are dull or which bits don't work or, or anything else. So I guess we should start off with sort of what is continuous delivery. So actually, put your hands up. Everybody put your hands up. Go on, everybody put your hands up. Okay, keep your hands up if you're doing continuous delivery. Okay, well. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the question, yeah. are you doing it or are you not doing it? Okay, so let's sort of go back to the definition of you are not doing continuous delivery unless yeah, your software is deployable through its life cycle. Yeah. Deployable through its life cycle is an interesting sort of debate at the moment. If you are doing branch-based development, is the software deployable through its life cycle? As in, the, the software that you build that's on the branch isn't deployable at the point that it's on the branch. It's not deployable until after you've merged it to mainline. So deployable through its life cycle. Um, prioritize the deploy deployability over new features. So always, always, always able to deploy the software. You know, never sort of waiting to finish some work until next week when suddenly it's going to become deployable again. So obviously there's a, a heavy reliance on continuous integration of things here. Um, automated feedback on readiness, so you know, case in point. Um, and push button deploy of any version to any environment. There's very few sort of uh, very few projects I think that are genuinely in in this state. You know, lots of people talk about continuous delivery. I think there's very few, but this isn't really what I want to talk to you about today. Because if you want to know about that, you can read the book if you haven't already read it. And there's lots of useful information on the technicalities of continuous delivery. So another description that I like, which is a little sort of softer, less technical. Um, which is basically just saying that it's about readiness for the business. So, you know, a ready feature can be put in front of real customers at little notice with no panic. And I particularly like the no panic point. I'm sure you've all been involved in the releases where it's uh, an early morning release or an evening release because you're expecting things to go wrong. Um, and, you know, there's certainly no panic is not what you experience in those, in those situations. Um, but really the thing that's interesting, I think, about continuous delivery when you look at it at a sort of a wider case is, is really around the using continuous delivery as a way to embrace sort of lean principles. So the two main lean principles are to try and have a smaller batch size and try and have a shorter cycle time. So we'll go into these two terms in just a little bit more detail um, in case people, people have probably heard of them but maybe people aren't 100% sure, sure what they mean. So we'll talk about these two, these two measures. <coughs> So batch size, relatively simple. Yeah. The quantity and, and complexity of a single unit of production deployment. We could do, um, we could really do sort of uh, definitions all the way down here. So we could just keep having to define define everything. But I think the important thing about batch size is that it's about what the definition of a single unit is. If you're releasing 15 different services at the same time, all of which are small, but all of which have to go forward and roll back together then they are all together a single unit. Yeah? So that's not necessarily a small, a small batch size. Yeah? And the, the complexity of it's really important as well because you know, the, the quantity is one thing, but actually you know, it's not about the amount of lines of code or even the amount of components, it's about uh, the amount of different changes um, that are in there. So you know, keeping batch size small um, is an isolation of cause and effect. So whenever you make a change, there's, there's a cause and that's going to have some effect. And hopefully the effect is going to be that you get a great new feature in production that can, people can use. But we also know that the effect might be that things break. Yeah? So the smaller that you keep the batch size, the better you're isolating the amount of causes that are in there and the amount of effects that can happen. So if a bad effect does happen, it's much easier to trace, trace back down. So you know, larger batch sizes, a few drops, you know, smaller batch sizes typically means, assuming you're delivering the same amount, it obviously also means a higher frequency of release. Yeah. So, in general, trying to release, uh, trying to reduce, uh, increase the frequency of your uh, releases. So, reducing the time between releases is a is a sensible way to start reducing batch size. Which sounds really obvious, and you do it. But there we go. 
I guess something that's a little less obvious is the effect that batch size actually has on, on other things. So this is Mary Poppendike, she was writing this in 2001 probably, um, and this is talking about utilisation. So utilisation is one of the things that people focus on loads, I'm sure you've been in situations where uh, you know, the management are particularly worried about how utilised uh, individuals are or how utilised teams are and whether they are being as productive as, as they can. Um, and this was a study that actually said that you know, utilisation increases you know, as batches get smaller. So it, it's almost the opposite to what humans think about by default. I think humans often think that you know, doing big batches um, is going to mean better utilisation. So there's famous examples like the envelope experiment. So you need, you know, you've got a stack of letters, you need to fold the letters, you need to put them in the envelope, you need to seal them, you need to stamp them, you need to post them. Um, and the experiment's been done lots and lots of times and the, the human thing is, right, I'm going to sit here and do all the folding, yeah, and then I'm going I'm to take all the folded things and put them all in, in the envelopes and then I'm going to sort of seal them all and then I'm going to stamp them all. Um, but you generally find that things are in much better control when you actually do small batches. So taking a single envelope all the way through um, is, is better. And obviously the, the other benefit there is that when you fold all the letters and realise that there's something wrong, they don't fit the envelopes or something, you don't have to go and refold all the new letters that you have to print out. It's a really rubbish example. But you know what I mean. Um, there's a blog post on our website actually on utilisation specifically and um, the, the sort of trade-offs between utilisation and, and flow, so it's maybe worth reading and um, going to. So cycle time, so this is probably slightly more complex than, than batch size, and I think people think of cycle time as being release frequency. Yep, so we talked about smaller batch sizes, um, a higher release frequency, a smaller gap between it, but that's not actually what cycle time is. You could have a very low, um, a very frequent releases, a very small time between releases and still have a very long cycle time. Because so cycle time is actually the wait time between an idea, yeah? so just the, the idea of a piece of value that, that, that you want to get in front of customers, you know, and that actually being in production. So if you think you could have a situation where you, you have lots of ideas, but each of those ideas takes a year to get into production, yeah? and you could be releasing those ideas in a year's time very close together, but still the cycle time is actually very long. Yeah, so cycle time and release frequency are not the same. They are sort of related. Quite often you'll find that they, that they are similar, but, but they're not the same thing. So you know, in this case, the frequency is the same, but the cycle time is smaller. The other thing that you'll notice here is that if you do have a long cycle time, you also probably, if you imagine there were lots and lots of releases here, you have lots of overlapping work. So here, things are overlapping. So you've got more and more work in progress. You're thinking about all these different ideas at the same time. They're all started, you're all progressing them all, but none of them are actually getting through. So you've also got lots of, as it's called in Lean, you've got lots of inventory. You've got all of this stuff that's partly developed, but none of it actually released. So you know, the, the shorter cycle time is a really good way to reduce your work in progress and to release the amount of inventory that you have. And that stuff, just looking at it financially, that stuff that you have invested in developing, that's sitting pre-production, waiting to get out to users. So let's go back to this definition of, of continuous delivery. Um, the, we talked about technically what you have to be doing to do continuous delivery. We talked about a couple of the things which are related to how you might, um, how you might achieve continuous delivery in terms of the lean principles of, of batch size and, and cycle time. Uh, these are typically the two things that are seen as being uh, the, the way to have close collaborative, uh, uh, sorry, the, the, the way to achieve continuous delivery. So the two things are extensive automation, all possible parts of the process. Yeah? So everything that you can automate, automate. You know, avoid manual repetition because obviously, apart from the fact that you get much more a much higher error rate with manual repetition, um, it also means that your brains are actually thinking about real business value rather than just thinking about doing doing real manual tasks. So I think most people recognise the the benefits of. of Sort of high automation. Um, and then the other thing is this close collaborative working relationship. And it's sort of an interesting term because it's, it's one of those terms that it sounds like you read that and you go, yes, of course, you know, why wouldn't you have a close collaborative working relationship between everyone involved in delivery? But if you read it quite carefully, it's like, it, it doesn't say that much. And, and actually, it's, it's pretty wide ranging. I mean, everyone involved in delivery, you know, in, in some organizations, could be an, an awful lot of people. Um, and you know, and what do we really mean by by working relationships? So, 
I guess a couple of the, the obvious things that a lot of people do. So hands up again. Everybody hands up again. Hands up. Okay, so keep your hands up if you're doing agile. Okay, yeah. Agile things, you know, the, all of the things around agile, working really closely with, with customer, ideally having on-site customer, you know, all of the sort of XP practices that are often associated with agile. Uh, you know, doing things iteratively, not doing huge amounts of work up front, that's all great and obviously it's really good in terms of working relationships. Having cross-functional teams is fantastic in terms of working relationships. Okay, everybody hands up again, we keep doing this, hands up again. Okay, keep your hand up if you're doing DevOps. I don't know what doing DevOps is, but yeah, DevOps all the things as well. So, uh, the, shifting, the shifting left, yeah, bringing operations in, obviously if you're talking about working relationships with everyone involved, then obviously the DevOps sort of mindset and the DevOps approach is has much closer collaboration and working relationships than sort of a typical throwing over the wall ops model. So so that's all fine. But um you know what about things like you know cab boards? How many people are doing doing agile, doing DevOps but still have like a cab board before they release anything? Yeah, you know, some change advisory board who who basically votes on, on whether your change should go through. Um, you know, and, and that's another case of things that, that slow down uh, your cycle time and, or incre you know, increase your cycle time and, and make it longer. Because it doesn't matter how fast you are at creating the value in terms of agile uh, sort of the teams, it doesn't matter how fast you are at releasing it with push button deploy, if you can't press that button, you know, even though the business are happy because some technology change advisory board is, is not sure about scheduling, then you aren't going to have the cycle times that you want. But actually, I want to talk about sort of a very specific type of working relationship, which is one of the things that I see causes the biggest problem in, in cycle times. Um, and I'll, I call this cascading referrals, which doesn't make any sense whatsoever, but hopefully it will do in a moment. So we have a development team. Yeah? We know what that looks like. And a request comes in, and we do some work. Yeah? Let's say we have a sprint. Yeah? So a request comes in. We're able to get to it really quickly. We don't have an enormous backlog. We deliver the work and we return it, as in we do a release to production, um, and that's great. We, we've delivered some value, yeah? So in that case, our cycle time, whatever it's, it's measured in, is, is one cadence. So one sprint or one iteration or one cadence. That's absolutely fine, yeah? What happens when a request comes in which requires a second team? Yeah, so a request comes in and team A picks it up, and then they're like, ah, we can't complete the value yet, we need a change in the service over here, or um, we're a front end team and this requires a back end change, or um, you know, we need, you know, even just we need people from that team to do work on our behalf because they need to set some templates up in that system over there, or, or whatever. Then, obviously, what happens there is that you've got one sprint, we've received the work, and then we're like, ah, we can't actually finish it until they've done their work, so we'll ask them to do it, they put it on their backlog. They pick it up next sprint, fine, but then that's the second sprint, they do the work. It comes back, and then the next sprint we can do the work that we had to do. Because obviously you could do the work in advance, but you don't know that the contract's going to work right with what they're doing, so you're generally going to wait, so you've got three, and then it comes back. Yeah? So then what happens when actually you've got three teams? Yeah, I'm not going to go through all these, but obviously it grows and it grows and it grows. And actually, if you look at your work process, you'll find that a lot of your features end up, depending on the size of the organization you're in, a lot of your features can't be delivered without referrals. And if you look at the, the actual effect of this sort of referral pheno phenomenon, um, and I call this the train wreck effect, because the more of these things that you add together, it requires scheduling. Yeah? So all of these teams are not sitting around waiting. So team B on, on that diagram is not sitting there waiting for team A to have a requirement. Yeah? They've got their own work to do. Yeah? So actually, when, they, when a request comes in, it needs to be scheduled. Same with Team C, they're not waiting for Team A to have a problem that gets past to Team B and then comes to C, Team C. So you end up with this train wreck of dependencies running down. Yeah? And this shows, obviously, just the, what we said, was that the amount of referrals that you need across teams and the uh, effect that it has on the amount of cycles. So I'm not talking about the time, but the amount of cycles, assuming that you're on sprints or iterations or cadences. Yeah? And that's fine. That's relatively normal. But that's a no delay line, the blue, yeah? That assumes that as soon as we say we can't do it, they will pick it up in the next sprint, and then as soon as they finish it, we'll be able to complete it in the next sprint, yeah? As soon as you start introducing some delay, then this grows exponentially. So if you flip this graph kind of round the other way mathematically, then it shows, this shows you this. And what it says is it says that the more referrals that you have, the more that you amplify scheduling delays, yeah? So one of the things that we really want to do 
is we want to look at different ways that we can try and reduce referrals, yeah? Because otherwise we know that even just with single referrals, the cycle time is going to grow, but when you take into account delays and scheduling, then it's going to grow exponentially. And there's nothing that you can do about it. Yeah? If you aren't able to deliver on, in your own team, then there's really nothing that you can do about that. You can make uh, priority calls on which teams will face um, the, the exponential um, delay, but realistically, you're always going to have teams experiencing that delay. Who knows who this is? Okay, this is a guy called Melvin Conway. He's described as a computer scientist, programmer, and hacker who did a lot of work in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and he's on Twitter today. Um, and you may have heard of his name from Conway's Law. Okay? So Conway's Law is something that I find myself quoting all the time. Um, and what it says, it says, any organization which designs a system, and this is not just computer systems, it's any organization which designs a system, but that includes computer systems, yeah, is constrained to produce designs which copy the communication structures. Yeah? So the classic example that's all, always used is that if you wanted to write a compiler, yeah, which obviously everybody wants to do every day. If you wanted to write a compiler and you've got four teams to work together to write the compiler, you would end up with a four-pass compiler. Yeah? Because it's almost inevitable that the way that those teams communicate will, as it says, it will force itself onto the design of the system that's being produced. And so really what this means, it means that we can't talk about things like system design, product design, architecture, without talking about people and, and teams, because the two are inherently linked and, and joined. And you will see this all the time, and you will probably be aware of this all the time, even if you haven't heard of Conway's law before. So you need to remember this, because it's important for the rest of the talk. Okay? So Conway's law says that basically communication structures of the, the teams will show themselves in uh, the systems that we build. Realistically, we don't want to end up with whatever systems